Today, we have a leading expert on China and Africa, Professor Deborah Brautigam, talking about aspects of China-Africa research. Professor Brautigam was due to give the keynote at the CSAE's China Economic Engagement with the African Continent Conference this month, which we had to cancel due to the coronavirus situation. She is the Bernard L. Schwartz Professor of International Political Economy and Director of the China Africa Research Initiative at Johns Hopkins Inter University School of Advanced International Studies. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Deborah. Um, so, when were you first interested in connections between the African continent and China, and how do you get involved in this research? Well, I, uh, when I started doing research on this, it was quite a long time ago. I came up with the idea in 1983 to look at Chinese aid projects in Africa for my PhD dissertation. And I did this because I was very interested in foreign aid and I was interested in international development. And I was a sonologist. So China was one of my fields. Chinese language was my language in graduate school. And at that time, it was very difficult to do research in China on things like rural development. So I decided to see what the Chinese were doing. I knew they had an aid program in Africa and no one had studied it. There was one um, book that had been done by George Yu looking at the Tanzan Railway in East Africa. But other than that, there was really nothing. And so I set out for a year and a half uh, to look at Chinese aid projects in the 1980s. And uh, I did that in order to look at several aspects. I wanted to see, were they trying to transfer their development model in China to Africa? And I found, no, <laughs> they weren't. Um, was what they were doing working any better than what the West was doing in similar sectors? So comparatively, did they do any better than what than we were doing? And in some ways there were, um, for example, in agriculture, the Chinese um, approach at, at the Chinese model, when they were doing it the way they did it in China, it worked tremendously well. But that was not transferable to Africans for a variety of reasons. And, uh, and then I was also interested in why did a Chinese approach that started out as a kind of cookie cutter approach in three different countries, it evolved very differently by the end of each project. And why did that happen? So that led me into a political economy uh, explanation for African agency and African governments making use of the Chinese aid projects for their own nation building and state building uh, projects and plans. So that was my PhD dissertation. And from there, um, I have to say that that became my first book and it just sank like a stone. <laughs> I published that in the 1990s and nobody was interested in that topic. Oh. Um, so I continued doing research on that. I looked at Chinese business networks in Africa, which became a kind of a side project looking at Chinese manufacturing business and engagement with African manufacturers. But it really wasn't until about 2006 that, that the rest of the world sort of caught up <laughs> to, to this fascinating topic that I had been looking at for quite a while at that time. Thank you. Um, what do you see as the practical relevance of research in this area? Um, what policy questions for what sorts of policymakers and in which countries and institutions could it help to answer? Well, those are a lot of questions there. I do think it's, um, China is, a, is of extreme importance geopolitically. I think that's become very clear over the past decade and particularly even more recently with the Belt and Road Initiative. So the, they're all lenses are on China right now. And so understanding the uh, reality of their engagement in different areas is extremely important. And what we find in the China Africa field, and often people who have been doing research on China more generally, we find there still uh, are these robust mythologies that are out there about just what the Chinese are doing. And that's been the case for quite a while because there's so little research on it. So you might get a newspaper report saying that the Chinese are doing these massive land grabs in Africa. And they want to grow food to send home to feed the Chinese people and they're using Chinese farmers to do that. And so then this one newspaper report, which may not even be based on having been there, 
gets circulated around and a whole narrative builds up about what the Chinese are doing. So that, that did happen, for example, on this land grab issue. And that was one of the big research projects that we had. We had a, a, about a dozen people working on this over three years. I wrote a book on it. We did research in multiple countries. We built up a database of every Chinese uh, agricultural investment project we could find. We looked at data coming from the Chinese side. And we found there was really very little going on. And that became the fascinating subject of my third book <laughs> on this topic. But I do think um, if we're going to engage with China, it's critical to have a fact base and evidence basis for our engagement and not to come to any um, meeting of uh, collaboration or uh, coordination with preconceived ideas that might be totally erroneous about what the Chinese are doing. So that's the, that's the first thing why I think it's really important. And then as the Chinese uh, evolve as international partners, um, they're going, what I have seen is not a move further and further away from what we sometimes call global norms or Western norms or liberal norms, um, but, but adjustments more in the direction of doing things uh, in a parallel fashion or more aligned with what we're doing. And this is a slow process. Uh, there are areas where it hasn't happened, there are areas where it's happened more. And so being able to track things like this, seeing the evolution of them, it's really important also for um, efforts to try to influence how China is, is behaving overseas. So those, those are important as well. Um, what sorts of research do you think is likely to be most helpful? Can you give some examples of useful past research, perhaps both uh, either produced by you uh, or by others? Um, and in parallel to this, how do you see China-Africa relations having evolved and how the research has changed over the years? Um, are there new developments that you see at the moment or, or coming up uh, in, the, in the near future? Well, um, I think here I would plunge into what we're trying to do right now um, at the China-Africa Research Initiative. We have been over the past, gosh, since 2006, really, we've been keeping our own database about Chinese lending in Africa. And we're preparing, we were going to have a big public event <laughs> in May to launch our database to the public. Um, that's unlikely to happen. But we will be making the data available to researchers and policymakers in an interactive database. And I think this kind of thing is, is um, incredibly useful because what, what our initial analysis of, of our data shows, and we've been publishing pieces on this, is that um, Chinese lending in Africa is, is very widely misunderstood. I think there's this general idea that it's Chinese loans that are responsible for the debt crisis and uh, people who haven't looked into it very carefully have this um, impression. And the first uh, paper that we did looking at that was a year and a half ago and we found that there were really only three countries in which Chinese lending was sort of overwhelmingly um, the cause of debt distress. And those were um, in Djibouti, the Republic of Congo, and Zambia. So there, you could point a finger to China. But even there, Zambia's, um, the pain that they're feeling from overborrowing is much more to do with euro bonds because euro bonds right now, well, there was a point when they were up to 20 um, basis points, 20% interest essentially. And I just saw something the other day that because of the coronavirus crisis, they're now at 54%. So um, Chinese loans, on the other hand, uh, have been falling in their cost because they're based, to, uh, based on global interest rates, which are sinking. So that's the kind of thing I think that evidence based in a, a sort of a, um, an approach to public policy questions that looks at the evidence can be really helpful, especially for cooling down um, what can be a very uh, passionate debate about these kinds of issues. So that's something I think that, that we're doing that, that I hope will be helpful. Um, and that should be helpful for African policymakers. There's another aspect of that, though, that I think um, that we're looking at. We have a paper right now on 
Chinese debt relief, in which we've analyzed uh, over 100 cases of Chinese debt relief in Africa, and also debt restructuring. And we're finding that these are very widely misunderstood. To come back to Zambia again, a Zambian economist uh, mentioned to a newspaper reporter that Chinese loans can easily be restructured or, or forgiven. That's not the case at all. So in our research um, points to the, the, the reason why I think this is widely understood is that they had a, a debt relief program for their very small number of zero interest loans or interest-free loans, which is a foreign aid instrument. And those are the ones that they were canceling. But, um, and there were a large number of those. But this doesn't amount to a whole lot of, of debt. And it's also, that program is kind of coming to an end because most of that is related to the debt crisis of the 1980s and the 1990s, uh, the so-called highly indebted poor countries uh, crisis, the HIPIC initiative. So that, um, that isn't understood by people there that are looking at, oh, the Chinese are doing all this debt cancellation. Well, it can create a moral hazard problem, i.e. governments who think the Chinese will cancel their debt easily might borrow more imprudently thinking that that might be the case. So those kinds of things, understanding how that works better is uh, something that we also are trying to shed light on. Thank you. Um, you. You talked a little about some of your, some of your own current research interests. Um, where do you see the current research gaps um, beyond this and where are there future research opportunities do you think? I think that um, there's, there's one area, well, let me backtrack here. So this is, because uh, I want to say a little bit more about other people's research that I think is really good. Um, there are a number of people that are doing what I would call either mixed methods research or research that involves deep field work. And this kind of research is really helpful for um, understanding how this black box of China actually operates overseas. And so uh, CK Lee at uh, UCLA did a fantastic study of Chinese engagement in Zambia, looking at the mining sector and also in the construction center uh, sector. And in both cases, she did it comparatively, looking at Chinese and non-Chinese actors. So this kind of um, comparative research in which you have case studies and you look very much at how these different actors um, engage um, on the African continent, this can give us more a, a much more fact-based um, basis for uh, either criticism of China if they're not living up to um, higher standards that are being used by others, or um, what she found in many instances is that the Chinese were doing things differently. In some cases, they were doing them better than um, the European actors. For example, the Chinese tended to have, during an economic turndown, they kept their uh, employers, or their employees on. They reduced the salaries, but they didn't uh, let them go to the same extent. So the European companies were much more about flexibility, which is the kind of globalization response, you know, labor flexibility. So there was a downturn in copper prices, you let everybody go, and then maybe even you move out because you've got a short-term mentality, whereas their mentality was longer term. So interesting things like that, I think, give us much more nuance into how the Chinese engage. So that kind of research is great. I'm really a fan of people who do, uh, even economists who, who actually venture into the field <laughs> and not just doing randomized controlled trials, which is all the rage right now, but to actually understand uh, the context for the phenomena that they're trying to investigate. And there, if we look back at Albert O. Hirschman and how he tried to understand foreign aid and development, we need many more people with that kind of approach. So it's great to do mixed methods research. Um, I think people who collect their own data, who do their own surveys, I have a lot of uh, respect for that. It's difficult. It's what we're trying to do as well. Um, people that use uh, sort of pre-made databases, I'm a little more skeptical of that. For example, um, foreign investment data, if people are doing cross-country research using FDI data on Chinese FDI, that's inherently really problematic. And for the simple reason that about 60 or 70% of Chinese 
FDI, foreign direct investment, is channeled through Hong Kong and other offshore financial centers. So we don't actually know uh, where it goes from there. So the data is very partial that we see, and you can't actually draw any firm conclusions about the impact of Chinese FDI with, with problematic data like that. And there are other large databases um, that I think also have, have some existing problems, um, databases on Chinese foreign aid, for example, that um, are, are getting improved, but still uh, have quite a few challenges with the accuracy. So researchers go out there, do your own surveys, have confidence uh, in, in the results that you're coming up with. There's one more area that um, I'm, I think, continually uh, wishing that somebody would, would do for. Uh, so what we did for the issue of Chinese investment in the agricultural sector, we really, I think, got the best data out there. Nobody's done that for Chinese investment in natural resources or uh, minerals or oil. And people ask me this question often about, you know, are the Chinese, are they still locking up the natural gas sector? Are they locking up the oil? And um, my evidence on this is only just anecdotal. For example, in Angola, you can see, even though the Chinese have been there for quite a long time and they consume the majority of Angola's oil, they don't own that oil. They're buying it from the European investors that have been there for a long time. So how successful have the Chinese actually been in obtaining equity in mineral resources, oil resources across Africa? I think this is a really interesting question that it also could help um, I think dampen down some of the continuing alarm about China locking up <laughs> these supplies that are going to be essential to the rest of the world. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so my final question really is um, what you see as the main constraints uh, to fruitful research. You've talked quite a bit about data um, not having a very, um, not having data that, that is really has full coverage. Um, so are there any other constraints that, that you see at the moment? I do think, uh, certainly at the moment, um, I found on my last trip to China that the, again, the geopolitics, I'm an American, um, there is a lot of uh, increased levels of hostility between our two countries. It was actually at the end of the trade war. While I was there, the trade war sort of ended. So this um, tit-for-tat uh, competition that's going on now between our two countries, uh, I felt it personally in that it seemed more difficult to get the meetings that I wanted to get. I was able to get them all, but it just was harder. And so that kind of thing, just being able to get, and I need to talk to top-level policymakers in the Chinese banks. I'm doing research on Chinese lending right now. So that's, um, that's really become an increasing challenge. Uh, China's lack of transparency, um, the fact that they aren't, they're, they operate much more like commercial entities. For example, you can't go to a commercial bank and ask to get copies of their loan documents. You know, they don't do that. And the Chinese are like that as well. So it's very hard to get these kinds of things and it's hard to do research on it because they consider it to be confidential information. That said, um, we have an uh, immense amount of information about it. And I think um, we're, we're doing really well in trying to understand this phenomena. But wouldn't it be easier if the Chinese would just publish this data themselves? <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> it would put me out of a job. That would be great. Brilliant. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah, for talking to me today and uh, discussing some of your um, past and present uh, research in interest in relation to uh, Chinese, uh, the China's relationship with various African countries. It's been fascinating and uh, thank you for, for taking the time to talk to me today. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much, Lizzie. Okay.